Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan. Thanks for tuning into this B education session. So this is one of several sessions that Bee City Canada is putting out to teach people all about bees and other pollinators. But this session in particular is going to be a crash course all about the magical creatures that we call bees. So why am I talking to you guys about bees? I actually spent a lot of time in a lab at Western University studying how bees think and what they do for my master's degree. So you can see me here posing for a graduation photo with our unofficial uh, lab mascot. But more importantly than any degree, I'm fascinated by the mysterious lives of bees and all the bees do for us. And I just love sharing all of this information with others. So here are just a few of the questions that we're gonna be exploring today. How many different types of bees exist? How many kinds of bees are out there? Why do bees and wasps seem so similar? Often people blame bees when wasps raid their picnic. And to be fair, it can be genuinely difficult to tell the difference. So today we're gonna to find out what that is. What even makes a bee a bee? What are the defining features of a bee? And then where do bees live? So do you think they all live in hives or do you think they live in other places too? I bet the answers to a lot of these questions are gonna end up surprising you. So before we dive in, just a little bit about the session. I wanna make sure this session is as interactive as we can possibly make it. So teachers, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video every once in a while. Uh, there's gonna be some time to chat as a class. There are gonna be some drawing exercises. So make sure that you've got a paper and pencil handy. And if you've got pencil crayons, even better. And then there's also gonna be some trivia spread throughout. But first, before I tell you anything about bees at all, I want you to reflect on what you already know about bees. So I want each of you to take a minute or two and draw what you think a bee looks like. And then once you've done that, feel free to take some time as a class to compare drawings and talk about what you think a bee is. So I'll let your teacher pause the video here and then start it back up once you've had a bit of time to, to draw your pictures and discuss. So I'm just gonna wait a few moments here before moving on. Okay, so what did you end up drawing? Maybe you thought of something like this fluffy bumblebee here. Maybe you thought of the more slender looking honeybee like this bee here. Or maybe you even thought of our good friend Barry from Bee Movie. But whatever you thought of, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that it had black and yellow stripes. That's not actually the case for all bees. Bees come in all kinds of colors, patterns, shapes, and sizes. There's of course the yellow and black honeybees or bumblebees that you likely thought of. But even among bumblebees, there's so many different kinds. Some have red patches like the red-tailed bumblebee you see here. Some have white patches like the white-tailed bumblebee. And then some have orangish patches like this rusty patched bumblebee you see here. Some bees are actually metallic green. So this is a type of sweat bee that goes by the fancy scientific name of Agapostamon viserans. And this bee has actually been named the official bee of Toronto. And it's not too hard to find either. I have a pretty small garden at home and I see lots of them flying around all summer carrying little balls of pollen on their legs. So this is a wool carter bee. It's black and yellow, but as you can see, there's no stripes on it. Instead, it has these little yellow dots on its back. And this is another bee I see in my garden pretty often. And another cool thing about this one is the way it flies. So unlike a bumblebee, which you might see kind of meandering around through your garden, going from flower to flower, looking a little lazy, uh, this bee actually kind of zips around. It looks a little like a hoverfly the way it moves. You'll see it one second, and then the next second, it'll just be in a totally different place in the blink of an eye. And as you can see here, bees come in a super wide range of sizes. 
So these are the smallest and the largest bees of North America. On the left here is a bee from the Perdita family. It's known as the fairy bee. It's only like two millimeters long, it's tiny. Uh, and then on the right is the largest carpenter bee. And this bee sizes in at a whopping inch long. You can see it's sitting on a quarter there. So it's about the size of a quarter. And carpenter bees are actually pretty common too. If you look closely in your garden, you'll probably be able to see quite a few of them. And you'll probably be able to hear them too. They have a pretty loud buzz as they approach. Okay, so I've given you a taste of bee life beyond the black and yellow honeybees and bumblebees that many of us are already familiar with. So there's the big bees, there's tiny bees, there's spotted bees, there's green bees. There's a lot of bees. But how far do you think this goes? So I'm gonna put it to you with our first trivia question. How many different bee species do you think exist across the entire world? A, 50, B, 200, C, 5,000, or D, 20,000? What do you think? So I'm gonna pause here for a moment just to give you some time to think, but if you want even more time to think about this and talk as a class, feel free to pause the video. Then once you're ready, our bee friend you can see over in the corner here is gonna fly down and show us what the answer is. So I'll just give you a moment here. All right, let's see what the answer is. Yep, believe it or not, there are over 20,000 species of bees in the world. So to put that into perspective for you, there's only 6,500 mammal species that we're even aware of. So you take raccoons, giraffes, gorillas, dogs, us, and there's still only a third the number of mammals as there are bees out there. There's so many different kinds of bees. It's pretty crazy. And if you're to travel the world on a bee tour, you would see some pretty fascinating animals. So this bright fuzzy friend is a blue carpenter bee. And this one can be only found all the way across the world in Malaysia, India, and China. Uh, this metallic green bee is found mostly in South America and Mexico, but we've actually seen some in the southern United States recently. We've found some coming up in Florida. And here we have a cloak and dagger bee. This bee is from all the way over in Australia. And this bee is actually what's known as a cuckoo bee, which means that this little sneak actually lays its eggs in the nest of other bee species so that it doesn't have to feed the growing babies itself. It just flies away and lives its life after that. It's crazy. But let's think for a moment just about Canada. How many different bee species do you think have been spotted just within our borders? A, 250, B, 500, C, 800, or D, 1700? So I'll give you a moment to think and then our bee friend is gonna fly down again and show us what the answer is. All right, let's see. 800 different species just within Canada. So there's lots of cool bees all around the world, but you don't need to leave home to go on a pretty great bee safari. And as long as we're talking Canadian bees, one that I've got to mention is Bombus polaris. So this is one of two bumblebee species that lives above the Arctic Circle. It's developed some pretty cool adaptations to be able to withstand really cold temperatures. So it's got super thick fluffy hairs like you can see here, even for a bumblebee. Uh, and it's able to regulate its internal body temperature by shivering its flight muscles to generate heat. So you can find it in some other cold places as well, like Alaska and Russia, but it still feels pretty much as Canadian as you can get for a bee. Okay, so now you know that there's all kinds of different bees, but where do they all live? So I'm curious to see what you think the answer to this is. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to draw the places that you think bees live. 
Uh, so as with the last time, feel free to pause the video for a couple of minutes to draw, and then even just to compare drawings and discuss as a class where you think these live. And then once you're done, you can start the video back up. So again, I'll just wait a moment here so that you have some time to pause before I move on. So maybe you do something like this, a classic yellow hive you see dangling from trees and cartoons. Or maybe you took a more realistic approach and drew something more like the honeycomb that you see honeybees constructing hives out of. Or maybe you knew that honeybees often build their hives inside trees and you drew something a little bit more like this with bees coming in and out of a hole in the tree to get to their hive within it. But maybe you went beyond honeybees entirely. Maybe you thought of a bumblebee nest, which looks much less organized than a honeybee hive. You can see in this picture, they've got little wax pots to store the nectar inside of instead of honeycomb. Or maybe you've seen these big carpenter bees going in and out of holes in the wood of a shed or a deck. And you thought of something like this with a little hole there and the bee popping its head out of. Or maybe you're familiar with bee hotels that are composed of these hollow tubes. And you thought of bees popping in and out of these hollow tubes, kind of like these little guys over here. Probably the least likely, but maybe you even thought of a hole in the ground that bees live in. But all of these are actually places that bees live. Well, I guess, except maybe not for the cartoon hive. So that brings us to our third trivia question. I just showed you that some bees nest underground, but do you think this is common or uncommon? So give it a guess, what do you think? What percentage of bee species nest underground? A, 5%, B, 16%, C, 53%, or D, a whopping 70% of bees nesting underground? So I'll give you a second here to think. All right, are you ready? Let's see. Yep, 70%. Most bees actually live underground. I don't know if this is a surprise to you, but it definitely was a surprise to me when I found out. And on that note, how far underground do you think bees can dig? So this is our fourth trivia question. How deep underground do you think the deepest bee nest was discovered? A, one foot underground, B, three feet, C, nine feet, or D, 12 feet down. So that's twice my height. And as you're guessing, keep in mind how small the typical bee is. So I'll just give you a minute here again. All right, let's see. Nine feet. Does that seem deep to you? Well, a little bee digging a hole this deep is actually the equivalent of a six foot tall person digging the length of four football fields straight down into the earth. And bees don't even have shovels like this guy. So it's pretty insane if you ask me. Okay, so now we've busted the myth that all bees live in hives, but who do you think bees live with? Do you think most species live together in large groups like the honeybees that we see in this picture here? Or do you think most bees live alone? So go ahead and give it a guess. How many species of bees do you think live alone? Do you think A, 90% of bee species live alone? B, 50% live alone? C, 10% or D, 1%? So I'll give you a moment here.
All right, let's see. Yeah, 90%. So once again, we're seeing that honeybees are perhaps the exception to how most bees actually live rather than the rule. Lots of bees are actually hanging out alone underground. So there's a few key things I want you to take away from this first section here. One, that there are thousands of different bee species. So over 20,000 bee species, if we want to be more exact. Two, not all bees are black, yellow, and striped. So they actually come in all kinds of different colors, patterns, shapes, and sizes, many of which we've seen here in this first section. And then the third thing, not all bees live together in hives. So often people think of the honeybee living in this big hive, but most bees actually live alone and underground. Very different from the honeybee way of life. So we've talked a bit about the bigger picture of how many different kinds of bees are out there and how they live their lives. But what actually makes an individual bee a bee? We know that a bee is an insect, so like many of its friends here, we know that insects share several common features. So because it's an insect, we know that it has a three-part body. So it has a head, it has this middle part called the thorax, which its uh, wings and its legs are attached to. Then it has this third part, that's the larger part that's called an abdomen. We also know because it's an insect that it has three pairs of legs, so you can see here. One, two, three. We know that it has two antenna, those little things up on its head that it uses to sense its environment. One, two. We know that it has two compound eyes that it uses to see. And we also know that it has an exoskeleton. So that basically means that its skeleton is actually on the outside of its body. So it's kind of like if we all had a coat of armor on covering our skin that kept our organs and our more squishy parts covered and protected. So those are all characteristics that are generally shared by insects, but that doesn't tell us how we can differentiate bees from other insects, especially these ones here, the wasps and the flies. So often wasps and flies can look pretty similar to bees. In fact, let's see whether you're able to even tell them apart. So we've got four insects here. All of these are either a bee, a wasp, or a fly, but only one of them is a bee. I wonder if you can tell which one is the bee, A, B, C, or D. So I'll give you a moment to decide here which one of these you think is a bee. And I'll just pause for a moment to let you think. All right, let's see. Yep, B is the B. So did you guess right? A is actually a fly. It's a fly that's known as a bee mimic. So it looks a lot like a bee. And then the two at the bottom are both wasps. So there's lots of features we can use to identify bees but I'm gonna show you some of the easiest things that you can look for when you see something flying around outside and you wanna know whether it's a bee. So bees usually have hairy and thick bodies like this one here. They also tend to have long antenna sticking out from their heads, these things that they use to sense their environment. They also have this really strange looking tongue-like body part called a proboscis. You can see here this little curved thing. And this is actually what they use to slurp up nectar when they're on flowers. And then they also have these special hairs on their legs that they use to pick up pollen and then bring it back to the nest. So if you see an insect with little clumps of pollen on its legs like this here, you can be pretty confident that that insect is a bee.
But here's a couple indicators that the insect you're looking at is actually a fly and not a bee. So if it has these really big front facing eyes that seem to meet in the middle, like these here, you're probably looking at a fly. And then second, if it has tiny antenna that you can hardly see, you can be pretty confident that it's a fly. If it's a bee, you'll be able to see them. But then for wasps, you wanna look at whether it has really slender looking legs and waist. So like this one here, you see these legs are super skinny and then this little section between the abdomen and the thorax is tiny. Then you also wanna look at how much hair it has. Bees are usually pretty hairy, but a wasp will be pretty smooth all the way through. But if you're ever in doubt about whether you're looking at a wasp or a bee or a fly, another really good approach is just to watch and see what the insect is doing. So if it's eating your cake, probably a wasp or a fly. Eating your bacon, probably a wasp or a fly. Eating your sandwich, what do you think? Yeah, it's probably a wasp or a fly. With the choice between bacon and a flower, where do you think the bee is gonna go? Yep, you guessed it, the bee's gonna go to the flower. And that's because pretty much all bees are vegetarian. So they gather pollen and nectar from flowers. They gather the pollen as their source of protein and they gather the nectar as their source of uh, carbohydrates. Wasps and flies will eat pollen and nectar too, but they don't eat them exclusively. It's not the only thing they'll eat. They'll eat all kinds of things, including bacon. So you're likely to see these guys crashing your picnic, but probably not a bee. But maybe you're wondering if bees and wasps are so different, why do they look so similar? And that's a really good question. There's actually a really good reason for it and it makes a pretty cool story. So this is a story I'm gonna share with you. So this is a story that begins a really long time ago. We're talking the dinosaur days long ago. So I want you to try to mentally transport yourself 150 million years back to the Jurassic period when dinosaurs roamed the earth and there wasn't yet any sign of a bee. If it helps, try to imagine that you're on the set of Jurassic Park just without any of the actors. So taking a look at this picture, do you notice anything different about the plant life then from the plant life today? Is anything missing? Maybe you guessed it, but there's no flowers here. It's just a sea of green plants. So the dominant plants of the time were ferns, cycads, and conifers, like these plants here. And the interesting thing about these plants is that they all relied really heavily on the wind for pollination. So instead of having insects move the pollen from plant to plant, the majority of plants at this time produced a huge amount of pollen, like this one, and let the wind carry it away, hoping that some of those tiny pollen grains would eventually be carried to another plant of the same species, fertilizing it, allowing it to develop seeds and produce baby plants. So this is obviously a much less, uh, much less efficient approach uh, than having animals like bees move the pollen from plant to plant bringing small amounts to the correct place every time. So most of the pollen from these wind pollinated plants wound up falling back to the ground wasted, not even reaching the plants that it was intended to reach. But before pollinating insects, what else was there for plants to do? So these roots here might look a little bit like legs, but it's not like the plants could start walking and deliver the pollen to other plants themselves. But eventually over 130 million years ago, the first flowers did appear, but they weren't the colorful fragrant ones that we know today. Scientists think that the first flower looks something like this, a lot like a modern day magnolia. So it has these white 
uh, large petals. And then it also has a lot of pollen in the middle, but it doesn't have any nectar. That's something that came along later on. So here's where insects enter the story. Long before bees evolved, there were actually flightless beetles and some other insects like flies that took notice of the pollen that flowers had to offer. Pollen's really protein packed, so it's a great meal if you're an insect. The beetles would go from flower to flower eating this pollen, and then the pollen would stick to their bodies as you went. So sometimes as they were moving between flowers, the beetles would unintentionally bring along pollen from one flower to the next, like this little beetle did here. And would leave some pollen. And then that pollen would fertilize the flower so that the flower could produce seeds like these and reproduce. So these beetles were actually doing the wind's job much more effectively. But meanwhile, as the beetles were moving from flower to flower eating pollen, predatory wasps were actually hunting the beetles. So they would catch them as they were eating away and then bring them back to their nests to feed the baby wasps. So you see this fly or this wasp catching the beetle, flying away, and it brings it back to its nest here. So they'd collect a whole bunch of these beetles to feed the baby wasps. But then often when they brought these beetles back to the nest, the beetles would still have pollen on them from the flowers that they'd visited. So they'd have these little pollen grains you can see highlighted here. And over time, the wasps realized that this pollen was actually pretty nutritious as well. And then slowly over time, the diet of some of these wasps shifted so that they were hunting fewer insects and gathering more pollen instead. So rather than hunting the beetles, some of these wasps ended up gathering pollen all on their own. And eventually some of these wasps switched completely from eating insects to eating pollen, adapting to this new diet slowly over time. And boom, that's actually how wasps eventually became bees. So eventually, slowly over time, wasps shifted their diet, eating more and more pollen, and they, they slowly changed over time, and that's how we got bees. So here's your answer to why bees and wasps seem so similar. They're actually biologically very closely related. The ancestors of bees were actually wasps. And then if you look here, you might be surprised to see that ants also evolved from wasps, but that's a story for another day. So as the evolution of bees from wasps was happening, there was also a huge shift going down in the plant world. So flowering plants that could be pollinated by insects were taking over, outcompeting the plants that relied on the wind for pollination. Insect pollination, as I've said, was much more targeted and efficient, and it gave them a huge edge. <clears throat> so as flowers became more common, they also exploded in diversity. They needed to attract insect pollinators like this little guy here. And these bees had all kinds of options. So flowers were constantly changing and evolving and diversifying to convince insects to stop by for a visit and pick some pollen up on the way so that the plants could also reproduce. So flowers of all different colors and scents appeared to stand out from the other ones and attract insects. Perhaps most importantly, flowers evolved to offer nectar. So these little drops of sugar water with essential nutrients that nourished insects and brought them back again and again. For bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds in particular, nectar is actually the most important source of carbohydrates. So they became very dependent on this nectar that, uh, that flowers had to offer. And flowers even developed these little colored landing strips we call nectar guides that signal to pollinators where to land on the flower for a sip of nectar. 
So you see this bee following in the little, the little dark spot that signals where it should go to collect the nectar. And all the while, bees and other pollinators were evolving to become better and better at collecting these pollen and nectar resources from flowers. So they became really intimately linked, bees and flowers. So let's go back and test your knowledge to see if you still remember some of the key features you can use to identify a bee. So which, which two of these four features are defining characteristics of bees that we talked about earlier? A, a short antenna. B, pollen collecting hairs. C, a thin waist and legs. Or D, a tongue-like proboscis. Uh, and as you're answering, try to think which of these things might help a bee to collect pollen and nectar from a flower? So I'll just give you a moment here to guess. All right, let's see what the answer is. So if you guessed B and D, you're right. So maybe these features make a little bit more sense now after that story. Bees have a tongue-like mouth part called a proboscis so that they can easily drink nectar from flowers. And they have these hairs on their legs to help them easily gather pollen that they can bring back to the nest. So it all makes sense. It helps them collect the food they need to survive. As bees and flowers were evolving and changing together, some species became especially closely linked and dependent on each other. <clears throat> and we call these species specialists. So take this bee here. This bee is known as a squash bee. And its life basically revolves around the squash plant. So it emerges from hibernation in late spring or early summer. At the same time, the squash plants are flowering and have nectar and pollen for them to eat. They wake up in the morning just as uh, the squash flowers are opening up to make sure that they can get breakfast in time. They have hairs on their legs that are well adapted to pick up the relatively large pollen grains of squash plants so they can bring it back to the nest. And then male squash bees even sleep inside the squash flowers as the flowers are closing in the afternoon to protect them from the, the heat of the afternoon. So clearly the squash bee is super dependent on the squash plant for its survival. But then on the other hand, the squash plant needs the squash bee too. So because squash bees focus exclusively on squash plants, they're particularly good at picking up pollen from them and transferring it from one plant to another. So they're not making stops on all kinds of other flowers and leaving the pollen there, only the squash plants. So the squash bees play a critical role in making sure these plants are fertilized so that the squash plant grows, then new seeds are created to keep the squash life cycle going year after year. So we've got specialist bees that are highly dependent on a particular plant for survival, but then we also have generalists. So these are bees that aren't so picky and they'll collect pollen and nectar from all kinds of flowers. So honeybees are a prime example of a generalist bee. They'll go pretty much anywhere that there's pollen and nectar that they're able to access. <clears throat> and the honeybees actually have a pretty incredible system for tracking down good food sources and then letting the rest of the colony know where the jackpot is. So you may have heard of this already, but it's called the waggle dance. And through this dance, a bee that's visited a particularly tasty flower patch can actually communicate the direction that these flowers are from the hive, the distance that the flowers are from the hive, and how attractive the flower patch actually is. And then the other bees in the hive can fly over and score some sweet nectar and pollen. So the dance goes something like this. The bee waggles forward as you can see in that straight line, it loops around, <clears throat> then it waggles forward again, and then it loops around again to close the circle. 
So the straight line that the bee's waggling in actually indicates the direction of the flower patch from the hive. Then how long the bee waggles before looping around indicates how far the flowers are. So if it only goes a little bit, that means that the flowers are pretty close by. But if the line is super long before they loop around, it means that the flowers are really far away. <clears throat> And then how intensely the bee's waggling back and forth. You see it does this as it's going up on that line. This indicates how exciting the flower patch is. So if it's a pretty small patch of flowers without much nectar and pollen, it'll be not a, not a big waggling motion. But if it's really exciting, they'll be going back and forth like crazy. So here you can see an actual bee demonstrating this dance. So it goes forward, loops around goes forward again, and then loops the other way and closes the circle. So it might be a little bit harder to follow here, but this is what it looks like in an actual colony. And then of course, there's lots of friends standing there watching to find out where the good flowers are. Okay, so it's probably extremely clear at this point that bees and flowers are very closely linked. Bees rely on flowers for nectar and pollen, which is the food that they need to survive. And then flowers rely on bees to move their pollen from one plant to another, allowing them to produce fruit, set seed, and ultimately create new plant babies that keep plants living on through the generations. But guess who's dependent on both bees and flowers? You probably guessed it, but the answer is us. So bees and flowers keep our grocery stores stocked. Bees pollinate the flowers that produce the fruits that we harvest for ourselves to eat. So think apples, blueberries, strawberries, watermelon, peaches, cherries, almonds, pears, the vanilla that flavors so many of our desserts, the coffee that keeps us or maybe your parents awake, tomatoes, or perhaps more important to some, ketchup. All these things come from plants that require insect pollination. And all of these things are only a small sample of the foods that do. <clears throat> And because bees are involved in producing so much of the food that we eat, and of course, just because they're really fascinating animals, it's concerning that we've seen some pretty widespread declines in their populations over the last few decades. So perhaps you've heard people talking about the disappearing honeybees or colony collapse disorder, where beekeepers would look into their hives and find them mysteriously empty. Honeybees are often in the news because they're super important to food production, but they're only a single species of bee, and bee declines go well beyond honeybees. Right, we learned that there's over 20,000 species of bees, and we're also seeing declines in all kinds of these wild species as well. And the thing about these bees is that they don't have the privilege of a beekeeper uh, to monitor their health. So a lot of these bees really just have to fend for themselves. So the question is, why are these bees declining? <clears throat> One very important reason for this is habitat loss. So we've turned a lot of the world's land into farmlands to grow the food that we need to eat. But that leaves much less room for the flowers that bees rely on for their food. And it also gives them less space to build their homes in. Uh, sometimes the crops we grow on farmland do provide bees with pollen and nectar, but uh, the plants may only be in bloom for a few weeks of the year, meaning that bees in that particular area might not have much else to eat for the rest of the season once those crops have stopped blooming or offering nectar and pollen. Another reason is pesticide use, which is actually something I've done research on myself. Uh, farmers use pesticides on crops to prevent uh, unwanted insects from eating our food as it's growing, which makes sense. But unfortunately, using pesticides often unintentionally 
harms the bees that are dropping by to, to feed on these plants for nectar and pollen. Sometimes pesticides will kill bees outright, <clears throat> depending on the type of pesticide, but usually they have much more subtle effects. They'll build up over time, slowing down the bees' movement, making bees less able to learn about which flowers are offering a valuable food reward so that the bee colonies will collect less food over time and then they won't be able to feed as many new bees and keep the populations going. More recently, we've also been learning about the effects of climate change on bees, right? So the world is getting warmer, but bees aren't shifting north at the same rate the climate's been heating up. So as a result, the habitat range for many of these bee species is actually getting smaller. And then all of these things I mentioned make bees weaker and less able to fend off parasites <clears throat> that occur in the environment. So it's kind of like when we get sick, if we're healthier, we're likely to be able to fight off the cold or the flu more easily. Same goes for bees. If they have like a diverse pesticide-free diet, then they're better able to protect themselves from parasites and pathogens that occur in the environment. <clears throat> so I'm not saying all of this to scare everyone. I'm saying it in the hopes that it'll motivate some of you to take action and do whatever you can do to make things right. And there's really a ton we can do as individuals to help. So one of the best things that we can do is plant flowers. All right, think about it. If your friend was hungry, what would you do? Probably you'd give them a snack. That's well, the exact same thing for bees. They need pollen and nectar as food to survive. So planting flowers is basically the equivalent of giving hundreds of your tiny bee friends a snack. So you could turn your entire lawn into a garden. It would look awesome and it would probably be a fun and rewarding project, but you don't need to go that far. Even just growing a single lavender plant in a pot outside is a great first step. <clears throat> Probably the easiest thing you can do is just pump the brakes on mowing your lawn. You see all those yellow dandelions growing on this lawn? A lot of people think of them as weeds, but they're actually a super important food source for bees in the spring. So next time you or probably your parents feel the urge to chop them all down, try to remember the value of dandelions to bees and just let your grass get a bit shaggy. Let the dandelions grow. I promise you that the lawn police aren't gonna come by your house and ask why your lawn's getting out of hand. Sometimes just let nature do its thing. It works out well. And if you decide to grow flowers, just make sure to avoid pesticides that could harm bees. So this is a pretty easy one. When you buy your flowers, make sure to check that they were grown pesticide free. And then of course, once you have them, don't spray any additional pesticides on the flowers yourselves, easy. A more fun option is to put up a bee hotel. So earlier we talked about how some bees actually build their nests in these little tunnels. So you can set these little structures like this one here out that has tunnels built into it. And you can set, set it in your garden so that bees are free to move in and out as they please. <clears throat> so I actually have one of these nailed to a fence in my garden. Uh, it took a couple of years, but I did have some wool carter bees move in uh, just this last uh, spring. And that, that's actually one of the bees I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so it's super cool to watch them kind of zipping in and out of these little tunnels and seeing what they do throughout the season. Another fun option is that you can help to track bees. So next time you're on a walk or in your yard and you see a bee, just try to snap a picture or two of it. Then you can upload that picture to a website called the Bumblebee Watch. And an expert there will be able to help you identify what species that is. So doing this actually helps scientists understand which bees are occurring where all over North America. It helps us track bees and understand what the populations are looking like so we know what to do. But perhaps most importantly, is try to maintain a sense of wonder for all the animals and plants that we share this earth with. 
learn about all the fascinating creatures on earth and the many different lives that they live, the unique things they're capable of doing and share this passion with others. Because when we understand and appreciate other animals for what they do and who they are, we have a tendency to be nicer to them or nicer to things that we understand. So I'd like to leave you with a quote from David Suzuki, who's perhaps the most well-known environmentalist in Canada. You've probably heard of him. So he says, there's no environment out there separate from us. The environment is embedded in us. We're as much a part of our surroundings as the trees and birds and fish, the sky, water, and rocks. So we often talk about protecting the environment or protecting the bees as if there's something separate or removed from us, something that we should feel obligated to do something about. But in reality, humans are also a part of the ecosystem. And to have our needs met, we need to make sure that the needs of the plants and the animals that we depend on are met too. So I wanted to leave you with that message because I think it's, it's really the most important message of all. If we wanna help the bees stop climate change or help any other animal on earth. So that's the session. I hope you learned a lot about bees and that maybe this inspired you to appreciate and support bees in new ways. So thanks for listening and make sure to check out all of the other bees, uh, all of the other bee videos on the Bee City website.